Um, and so we went with this one, which uh, honestly, uh, it's, it's also not completely accurate either. Molly used to work at Intuit on TurboTax a little bit, so she's our tax researcher. But don't ask her to do any taxes for you, because that's not really what she does. But this is really the more accurate version of the kind of talk that we uh, want, wanted to get into today. So why would why we hire a qualitative researcher? What? To work on a baseball game. So anyway, uh, here's some details of me. Molly will introduce herself more in just a couple of minutes. Um, I've been a games user researcher since the late 90s. Uh, I'm old, I've seen lots of things. Uh, and I manage the uh, team down at the San Diego studio, which is a part of uh, Sony Interactive Entertainment and so forth. Um, and uh, so and you see games that's kind of spread across time, stuff from all the way back from uh, 2001 with Munch's Odyssey, and uh, I did some interface work on the Xbox for a while as well. But I've been a manager of teams uh, as a part of that, and that's kind of an important point to maybe remember a little bit later. So anyway, a couple years ago, I decided to pack up all that research and uh, all that experience into my car and head south to San Diego, where the uh, primary title um, had, had, had just released their latest iteration, the 10th anniversary version of MLB The Show. And uh, a month later, they hired me. But, um, but just talk about, let's just look at this for a second. And I want you to just think about you know, all the times that you've you know, taken on a new partner and worked with a new title. And realize that a uh, game that has been successful for 10 years in a row, every year in a row, is actually kind of a daunting uh, thing to take on. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're at the point where they're releasing actual baseball bat material as the, uh, <laughs> the case for the game, and people will buy that version. Um, but anyway, it's a, very, a veteran team, successful over and over and over again. Uh, and as it happened during my interview loop, uh, none of the baseball team was involved because they were very busy shipping this game. And so when I showed up uh, with all my experience, uh, they kind of looked at me and said, what are you here for? Oh, OK. They're, they're a nice set of folks. It's a, a perfectly great set of people. But um, uh, they were kind of like, OK, well, let's see what you can do. Uh, and so I went about my business of just trying to examine this title. And this, of course, is uh, the single most important title that the studio puts out. And I was also in the process of formulating the ideas for how I would build out this research team. It's now five of us down there. And so I examined the title, and there's very well-established core gameplay among these kind of uh, critical components of uh, a baseball game, uh, and several uh, very successful game modes that have been around for a long time. And I want you to pause again and just uh, think about, you know, from a bread and butter standpoint, as a games user or researcher, how much of your time is spent just trying to focus on getting these kind of, you know, the basics of the gameplay straight. Um, and this game had already had things straight, and had so for 10 years. Well, OK. Well, anyway, that's a little daunting. But um, maybe there's this other thing with this microtransaction. No, no, no. They actually already had a great analytics team present and already involved in this microtransaction world, a very lucrative piece of the uh, puzzle. Maybe, maybe the reviews and so forth aren't so good. No, that's actually not the case. The reviews are great. That's a little bit of Metacritic there. Here's a nice quote. And it will be 15 to show. Is the best baseball game ever made? Interesting. OK, the best. There's a user quote, also kind of interesting. And um, so uh, at this particular moment in time, there was sort of like this, hmm, how should I uh, move forward with building out this research team? Uh, and clearly, we hired a qualitative researcher, so that's kind of the answer. Um, but um, there were a couple of clues that kind of uh, stuck out for me that were uh, kind of helping with the reasoning on why we would go in a, a qualitative direction. But I'm not going to get into that immediately, what I want to do instead is hand the uh, microphone over to Molly and uh, ask her to just talk to you about the kind of qualitative research that we do um, on MLB The Show at the San Diego studio. Molly. Hello, everyone. I'm Molly Sirota, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the benefits of qualitative research as games user researchers. Um, I want to stress, though, that what I talk about today isn't about how qualitative research or qualitative data should be prioritized over usability data. What I'm going to be talking about is that there are times in our field where qualitative data should be prioritized with the usability data that we're prioritizing instead of keeping it secondary. Um, but before I do all that, I'll give you a little bit of background about me so that you have some context of where this is all coming from. Um, I've been doing research for about 10 years now. I need to step over. Sorry. 
Um, so I've been in the research world for about 10 years now, and most of my career has been on the consulting side, which means that projects changed all the time, clients changed all the time. Um, they're one week I could be working on, yes, a tax product. Um, next week I might be working on a medical product. Week after that, working in automotive. After that, working in education. And then after that, working in video games. So the projects changed all the time. And what was interesting about working in the consulting side of research is that we never really vocalized that we were usability researchers. We were simply researchers. And what that meant is that as projects came into us, we didn't approach the project and say, what would be the best usability method to answer the question that's in front of us? We simply said, what would be the best research method, regardless of discipline, that we need to use to answer the question in front of us? We started with the question. And sometimes that meant that a study needed to lean heavier on qualitative data or prioritize the qualitative data along with the usability data in order to give a clear picture of, of what was happening with the product. And that's going to be what I'm going to spend time talking about today, that there are moments during our profession where we need to prioritize the qualitative data along with usability data in order to give a clear picture to our development teams on how they need to think about their users, on what actions they need to take in the game in order to make it more successful. Um, so I'm going to go through a few different qualitative practices that I'm sure you guys are already doing. Uh, the first one is I'm just going to go through a pretty standard qualitative discussion. Um, first, just outlining the discussion itself and then talking about the benefits of the data that's coming out of this qualitative discussion. So I support the team MLB The Show. So this will be a pretty standard way that I might start a discussion with a user that plays MLB The Show might say something like, what do you like about MLB The Show? And they say, it's immersive. OK, well, what makes it immersive? How do you define immersive? The user says, the sounds, the roar of the crowd. Why do you like the roar of the crowd? It makes me feel like I'm really there when I'm stepping up to bat. What emotions or feelings go along with the experience when you feel like you're really there and stepping up to bat? Excitement. So I'm sure everybody in this room is saying, yeah, that probably that looks like a pretty standard qualitative interview that we're already doing in our field. And again, the talk today isn't about how we're not doing qualitative research. I think everybody in this room is doing qualitative research. It's more about that there's benefits to leveraging the data that comes out of these qualitative discussions to direct our teams on where they should focus their time. So now I'm going to go back through this same interview and talk about some of the benefits that can be pulled out of this data. So we first started just very broadly. What do you like about MLB The Show? User says it's immersive, which is pretty vague. Um, so we have to keep digging. And how do you define immersive? The user says the sounds of the crowd. Now in our game, the sounds of the crowd play throughout a good chunk of the whole game. So I don't really have a focused point to direct my teams to spend time on yet. So I have to keep digging. And why do you like the sounds of the crowd? And the user says, it feels like I'm really there when I'm stepping up to bat. Now imagine that this is a data point, not just from one user, but from a theme of users that we t have been talking to. I now have a data point to provide to my team on where they need to focus their time if they want to create more immersion in their game. I now have data that says if you want to enhance the immersive experience, focus your energy at the at-bat experience by enhancing things like the sounds of the crowd during that moment. And I'm leveraging qualitative data to provide this kind of direction. The interview keeps going. We ask about the emotion. What emotion do you feel when you're stepping up to bat and you feel like you're really there? User says excitement. The emotional piece in our research is also extremely important in order to give direction to our teams. If we're talking to our users about an experience in our games that are supposed to be delivering an important or an intense emotional experience, and you ask, what emotion are you getting from this experience? And the user says, I don't really care, just feeling kind of meh. That in itself is a data point to go back to the team and say, 
We need to rethink this experience. We need to spend time in this moment in the game that should be delivering an emotional experience and it is currently not doing that. And we're able to do that by leveraging qualitative data to direct our teams. Another part that I want to talk about is where we do our research. A lot of time, most of us are in um, lab settings. We're doing play tests, we're in li living room settings. I would encourage getting out of the lab setting, going into the natural environment of where your users play your games. Now, I work on a console game, so that means I'm typically in bedrooms that, yes, do look like that, um, or I'm in living rooms but you might work on PCs or mobile games, and so your environment might be a little different than mine. But the point is to get in the environments where your users are actually playing your game. The environment could be potentially impacting both positively and negatively the way your user is playing your game and the way your user is perceiving your game and you want to spend time having a qualitative discussion about the environment that they play in. Forget about talking about the game for a minute. Just ask about the environment. What's going on in here? Who else is in here typically with you? And we've done this before for MLB. One study that we did this for happened to be around a time where the team was focused on the first time user experience. And so they were designing things like tutorials, like, like what you see here. Uh, which were text-based. They informed the user on what to do on the controller in order to complete a certain action in the game. So anyways, we're in users' homes and we're talking to them about the environments that they're playing in and we discover that our users are playing in environments that their kids are also playing in at the same time. And they're playing in environments that are also their home offices. We have one guy who's a furniture designer who upholsters furniture in the same room where he's playing games at the same time while playing our game. Now our game is E-rated, which means that our users don't have to wait to, for the rest of the household to go to sleep before they play our game. What, is, what this information is telling us from a qualitative interaction is that we're no longer identifying a user want or a user need. We're identifying a requirement for our game, a requirement that is not just for first-time users, but for all of our users that is stating that our users are distracted. And if we're going to offer a first-time experience that offers a text-based information system, we're not going to be as successful. So we're able to leverage this qualitative data and go back to the team and say, we need to create a game in its entirety for a distracted audience. So that this year, when the game gets released, we'll now start seeing visuals to go along with these tutorials, audio to go along with these tutorials, along with text, so that we can balance out the fact that we have a distracted audience. And we're getting all of this from leveraging the qualitative data that's coming out of research. The last piece that I want to talk about is the fact that this is qualitative data that we're talking about. Um, so sometimes you're going to want to do um, a second study, or sometimes you're going to want to have a larger sample size than you normally work with because it's qualitative data that we're talking about. And we've had to do that before, again, for MLB. And one project in particular had to do with a new mode that they're coming out with called Retro Mode. And Retro Mode pays tribute to the 1990s 8-bit classic video games, kind of like what you see here. The team wanted to create a promotional piece that was going to be used at an upcoming convention, the PlayStation Experience Convention, but they didn't know what to include in this promotional video in order to promote retro mode. And that's another beauty of qualitative research is that you can leverage it to create promotional pieces, to create videos for conventions, to create Twitch streams, to create content for YouTube streams. So we went out and did some research to figure out what should they be addressing in this promotional piece. And what we found is that we didn't, had to do a second round of research. The first round involved one-on-one -on -one sessions, a little bit of playtime, some think out loud. And we ultimately decided that we needed to go out and do a second round of research. So we did a second study that involved a play test with a survey attached to it and some open-ended questions so we could collect additional data. With qualitative research, sometimes you need to do 
a second round of research. Sometimes you're going to need to have a larger sample size. What we were able to do with this particular study is leverage both the usability data and the qualitative data to go back to the team and say, within retro mode, what users are really gaining from that experience and what will capture your audience's attention is the combination of current graphics with pixelated UI during a home run experience. And we were able to identify this and direct the team on where to focus their time and energy by leveraging and prioritizing both the qualitative data and the usability data. There are times in our field where in order to provide a, that big picture of where our teams need to focus their energy on how they need to think about their users, on what they need to do in order to enhance the success of the game that you're supporting, there are times where we're going to have to lean on qualitative data and usability data instead of keeping qualitative data secondary to usability. And on that note, I'm going to hand it back over to Ramon, who's going to talk a little bit more about qualitative research. Thank you, Molly. <clears throat> so I'd really love to get into some uh, topics around qualitative data analysis. Uh, but the fact is, there's really not enough time. So I, I first off, I just want to uh, talk about what I mean about qualitative data analysis. There's numerous ways to make something like this work. But if we imagine we have a bunch of post-it notes, the, very, the sheer process of putting things on post-it notes, you're kind of giving everything equal weight at step one, which is kind of an interesting thing, because you might have lifted hell in high water to get some piece of data from you know, um, thousands and thousands of users that ends up being scribbled on one post-it note, bump, and then another post-it note gets uh, a definition of immersive based on a bunch of interviews, um, and you kind of give them equal weight. To me, that's one of the interesting parts about qualitative analysis. Um, you go through a step like this, what's in common, uh, what, what has to be paired up, uh, maybe there's a few patterns that uh, become interesting and so forth. Uh, and eventually rules, processes, requirements uh, can pop out of something like that. I'll just pause here for a second because I see a few pictures coming up. Um, <clears throat> now I want to get into greater detail, but like I said, I can't. There's not enough time to really get into this. But luckily there's like whole books, they're like amazing, uh, all kinds of details and there topics like that. There's a couple of things, resources I tend to use. I uh, attended a training at CHI many years ago. Um, and then the Miles Huberman book is a pretty good uh, overall resource. And they get into all kinds of stuff. Um, and this is just sort of the whiteboard of like trying to fig my, me trying to figure out what thing I want to pick out here and maybe just go into into some detail here. Uh, the giant uh, bubbles and arrows thing, that's the Miles Huberman model. Um, and that's, um, those arrows don't all point in one direction all the time. It's actually kind of a complicated thing. Technically, if you wanted to go through uh, um, Molly's qualitative interview a third time, we could show how it actually maps into uh, this kind of framework as well. You are checking in real time, what, are, what do you mean immersive? What do you mean the crowd? Et cetera, what does what being up at bat mean? And that's sort of the back and forth of this. But there's things about the sampling. There's things about the way bias comes into play. Your bias that you're creating as a researcher in your presence, or the uh, bias that the um, uh, environment is having on you as a researcher, all kinds of things. Um, but the thing that I think that we do have enough time to talk about is just kind of up, the, up at the top there, where it says research must speak to an audience. And uh, I want to get into that because I don't feel like the books necessarily tell you this as clearly as they can. And it also comes back to the why we hired our axe murderer to um, uh, work on a baseball game. Uh, and it's really just this question. If, if research must speak to an audience, then uh, in my mind, if somebody comes to me with one of these questions on the right side, we're starting from the question, I usually end up moving towards the left. Your mileage may vary. This is the sort of thing where there's uh, lots of reason to debate uh, you know, different approaches and so forth. But this is kind of a basic framework. And so what kind of question tends to drive the qual it, it tends to have you arrive at qualitative research? Um, and to me, it's this question of are we making the right thing? Are we on the right path? Are we going to expend our resources in the correct way? That's what this is about. And so when we looked at these examples I had earlier, this, uh, these kind of bolded sections, it's hard to top their own game. To me, that means we have to break context. Labs are fantastic for simulating things where you already kind of know what's going to happen. If you don't have that basic sim um, assumption to make, then you've got to get out of the lab and understand the world. 
So we got to get out into a uh, qualitative uh, field researchy perhaps format. And then the, uh, the user quote on the right, that was a user quote off of the Metacritic. That's sort of a clue that um, a lot of um, classic field uh, techniques, uh, longitudinal kinds of approaches can work. And that puts me in a very qualitative mindset. And so to me, that's sort of the why. That's the answer for why we felt like a qualitative researcher was going to be right for a, a title that's been successful year over year over year. But with the remaining time, I don't know if there's a lot of time, I, I did want to get into one little bonus topic as well. Because the audience blank, when you fill it in here, is an interesting one that you should really strongly consider. And leadership, uh, this can mean any number of people, but I'm specifically meaning design leadership, production leadership, studio leadership, executive leadership. Those folks are looking to get this kind of question answered more often than not. Uh, I used, when I was um, early on in my research career, I used to get really frustrated when I had this great usability level understanding of all the flaws in the game. And so why wasn't I just automatically involved in the discussion around version next and so forth? And it's because I really wasn't showing up with the right kinds of uh, data for them. Um, but the interesting thing uh, that I want to get into, and I'm going to stop talking to you so much as a, uh, whatever, an experienced researcher for a minute here, and I'm going to spend a bit more time on the uh, experienced leader uh, of uh, teams here. And we start a little late, and I'm seeing less than one minute, so do we have to really rush here? So anyway, we can. Anyway, it's pretty familiar to leaders, so what do I mean leadership? I don't mean go read these books, and then you'll be in charge of this uh, very concerning bit of iconography. Uh, I mean something more like when it comes to decision making, how are you going to distribute your resources, how are you going to think about um, uh, placing your tasks, and wh wh where are you going to spend your time, those kinds of questions that, that uh, leaders are commonly asked to answer. That um, these are um, uh, complicated things, and it turns out that if you get in the mindset of your production leadership and studio leadership and executive leadership, you'll find that they're actually facing a situation not unlike this quite often. And they have a, uh, a quandary where all possibilities, all directions they could be uh, uh, pointing their team at have some kind of weight. There's things they care about. There's things they're good at. There's dependencies. There's processes. It's, it's, if you think about it, it's a very similar process. I'm not going to pretend that any leaders you're working with are using a for formal process like this as often as they could. But this is an insight that I just wanted to share with you that I think is, uh, is pertinent. If you want to be a, um, a great researcher, then qualitative research belongs in your tool belt. Uh, but qualitative data analysis, getting good at doing that, that's going to help you uh, be a leader to your teams in the kind of partnership way that you currently have. If you decide to pursue any kind of management or research management and uh, career steps, then it's going to prepare you for the kinds of decisions you're making about how you direct resources. Um, and frankly, it's going to help you in leading anything you may want to do. And that's our talk. So I don't think we've got much time for questions. We go? Oh, we got five minutes. Sorry. <laughs> Any questions? Yay, yeah, nay. You probably have questions for Molly, right? <laughs> Go right over there. Or, oh. All right. So besides the distractions, what, is, what was your biggest surprise coming out of the uh, home visits that you've done in your game? In terms of data or just in general? <laughs> Both. <laughs> Um, you know, what's interesting about being in people's natural environments and for us because that because it's console games and because that means you're in their home and I work on a sports video game. So there was one moment where I walked in the house and I actually tripped over Steelers slippers. Like there's just sports paraphernalia all over the place. And all of that can be leveraged in the game as well. Taking in the environment that your users exist in and you can leverage that inside the game at times as well. If you're building a, um, a, a virtual reality kind of thing, you can leverage the types of items that are in the environment that your users play in because then they'll be able to identify more with what's going on in the game. So I think a lot of times because we were focused a lot on sports. We were looking at the type of sports paraphernalia just throughout the house and what else was mixed with it, which oftentimes was music stuff, posters and whatnot. Um, yeah. Over there. 
In field work, uh, the true surprise is usually the smells. Some people did not let me into their bedroom where they actually played. And some people did, and there were barriers like clothes and whatnot, so climbing over things. So that <laughs> that's always interesting. <laughs> You hinted that uh, you had to sort of prove yourself at the start, Ramon. And um, I'm wondering, following on that, uh, how did you prove the use of qualitative uh, methodologies in the case where they probably should have used them, but may not have been uh, fully on board? I have a long-standing process of not necessarily asking permission if I don't feel like I really have to. So I just hired the qualitative researcher and told them that's what we need, and they said okay. <laughs> so uh, there, you know, in many places we are going to be the individual experts, and it's okay to take license with that uh, from time to time and uh, use those insights. And we are out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.